first of all, I'd like to thank the committee who ever put this on for asking me to participate in it. It's always a, a gift to be part of Narcotics Anonymous. It's a gift for me. This streetwise kid from the Bronx to who I am today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it and my experience with recovery and probably some things you never heard before because this isn't a regular convention and I'm not going to do the regular talk. I may get into the steps. I may not. Uh, wherever my creator is going to let me go, that's where I'm going to go today. First of all, I want to thank my creator who Narcotics Anonymous brought back to me. And I want to thank my two spirit guides, Wolf Clan Mother and the White Buffalo Woman who are part of my vision from early on and are with me today. We all need guidance. And you may think I'm a kook, but I get my guidance on the other side of the hanging rope as well as on this side. And a lot of things come to me and this was all grown here. I turned my back on God when I was very young. I grew up in the Bronx. My father went for a loaf of bread at one time and never came back for quite a while. And I wanted to fit in. I wanted to belong to somebody. And the older people out there were the people who I gravitated to. Sure, I was a little bit of the neighborhood clown because they say, go for this, go for that. And they reward me. When I first, the things I was getting rewarded with was, was beer and pre-rolled reefer called sticks. And they taught me what Carbona was. And if you're not from New York, you probably don't know what Carbona is. But it's a starter drug for us little kids in grade school. It's a dry cleaning fluid and you take your hanky and you soak it in it and you wring it out. You put it in your back pocket and all day in school you're sniffing away. And the teachers come into the neighborhood and they say, I don't understand this neighborhood. Everybody's got a cold all the time from the hanky they're up there. And then the next thing we did, we used to wear garrison belts. And back then, the buses had bumpers, and we had to go someplace. So you'd hook the garrison belt back of the bumper and ride I mean, the bus and ride up and down Third Avenue. And if you're from New York, you remember those days. And so, you know, that was the environment that I, I, I grew up into. And by the time I was 10 years old, I fell in love with the needles. And I used that needle from the age of 10 to the age of 20, well, almost 20, a week before I was 20 years old, where I was dying in the gutter. Dirty needles, dirty living. And life went on like that. And, you know, I didn't really know much about, I knew there was a Narcotics Anonymous. And I'm going to tell you about a Narcotics Anonymous that preceded this Narcotics Anonymous. And I'm one of a few people alive today that have, was a member of both Narcotics Anonymous. I don't know if many of you remember Fran. Oh, you used to do a lot of speaking thing. She was in that fellowship with me. She's now Fran D in Hawaii, still alive today. And we both were part of that old NA with the junkie priest, Father Dan Egan. And I had a sponsor in that, that thing called a girl by the name of Ray Lopez, who she founded that fellowship with Danny Carlson. And she picked up a nine-year chip in 1959 in the woman's house of detention in Manhattan. And I got clean in 59 and relapsed. And the addict I am is I blamed her for my relapse. She was my sponsor. She should have kept me clean. How many of us have said that? And I was friends with her until she died in 1972. And the greater New York region has a book called The Impossible Dream. And you can only get it from the, the greater New York NA region. And it gives the history of NA in New York from 1949 right up into this fellowship here. And that fellowship was a little bit different than this fellowship because we didn't have traditions. You got to remember, traditions were only written in 1953. But what they did is they followed the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous like this fellowship did. But there was a little different because in Narcotics Anonymous or in, in New York itself, there were laws called the, the, the Rockefeller laws. And a little bit different than California. In California, if two people on probation or parole got caught together, you get busted. But in New York, if two card-carrying addicts 
registered heroin or, or opiate addicts, as the card said, were caught, you did 15 years in the joint. So having a meeting with a bunch of guys with cards in their wallet, because by law we had to carry them, and you were raided by a narco squad, you went away for 15 years. And so they had to make a deal with the New York City Department of Health that they would take a $10 a year stipend from them so that they would be under the direction of the Department of Health so that when the meeting were thinking you were in a government facility, the narcotics squad couldn't touch you. You could meet together because you were under a government agency. And in 1959, Danny Carlson, and I, I, I met Danny only once when I was 13 years old and I didn't stay in recovery. But in 1955, Jimmy Kinnon and Danny Carlson were talking about merging the two fellowships. But Jimmy said that you have to follow the traditions. And Danny said, we can't follow the traditions. We have to take money from the city in order to survive. And the merger never took place. And the fellowship grew in their own way until Ray Lopez died in 1972. And that fellowship changed their name at that time to Drugs Anonymous, because at that time the hippies were all coming in and it wasn't Narcotics Anonymous, didn't reflect the generation coming in. She fought that till the day she died. But in 1980, the Rockefeller laws were repealed. And this fellowship grew almost overnight in New York. And a lot of people put a lot of into do it in a lot. I was out of New York in 1980, but there was a lot of people that, that, that got together in this fellowship. That's why it grew overnight in New York, because they were familiar with, as a matter of fact, the name Narcotics Anonymous was coined by a woman from the Salvation Army, Brigadier General Dorothy Berry, in the New York City prison system. And so that's how, when Danny got out of the joint in Lexington, Kentucky, he started the fellowship. He wanted to call it Addicts Anonymous, like they did in Lexington. And Dorothy Berry says, no, Danny, I've been putting the footwork for Narcotics Anonymous in the jail system here since the 1930s. Call it Narcotics Anonymous. And so the junkies knew that name because they were exposed to it in the city jails, not in the prison system, but in the city jails. And so the name Narcotics Anonymous, and when the California Fellowship came to New York, it was like a miracle overnight. It grew. And a lot of people don't know that history. And thank God, when Mark was saying earlier, some people locally were beginning to write the history of their area. New York City put a lot of time, research into it, validated everything. And I have a copy of the corporation papers from 1949, Narcotics Anonymous Incorporated in New York State. World Service Office owns the registered symbol, but they don't own the name Narcotics Anonymous. Just like they hold the copyright and trust for the basic text and they don't own it. All the other literature they own because when Dave Moore had in the suit with, uh, uh, with the uh, um, World Service Office with the baby blue, the judge made a ruling that anything, a labor of love that addicts write for themselves and wrote, write and edited by addicts cannot be held in copyright by the World Service Office and has to be put in trust. <laughs> And that's why every piece of literature today has a professional writer, because they have to pay somebody so the office can own the copyright. And our process is different. And the reason I'm bringing this up, we've just seen the film on the basic text, about the cutting and the pasting and all that stuff. That was the labor of love. And the fellowship, you, me, and everybody owns that basic text, not the office. Now, the other literature I'm not saying is bad because there's good stuff in it. But it wasn't written the same way by addicts for addicts. And in the beginning of the book, Living Clean, it says this book is written by addicts by addicts. And the truth is addicts had put in input. But that, and they had some working committees, but then it was turned into the professional writer. And the professional has not chose what will be in there and chose what not. Where in this other way we did it, we chose it. In that film, it showed the book laying on the table. That book wasn't the basic text, it was the gray book. The gray book was the compiled of everything that they did in the, in the basic text. I mean, in the literature committee. That came out and everything was numbered. As Bo said in that thing, every line was numbered. Because first of all, we had this all this stuff. If we had to publish that book, we didn't have the money to do it anyway. And so what they had to do is they had to go and form the approval form 
and they send out what could be taken out of that great book and what would be left in so they could have a book that could be, be published. The rest of the stuff was held out and was supposed to be an advanced text from the rest of the literature, and it never happened. Because what happened, the basic text became a money cow, and money after money kept coming into the office, and people got a little bit greedy. They even changed the locks on the door and kicked Jimmy out. He came to work on a Monday morning, and the locks were changed. Nobody wants you to know that. All of his personal stuff was in a cardboard box on the porch. He died a couple of years later, and it was called cancer, but it was really a broken heart that attracted it. Let's be honest. This is a fellowship about honesty, and that, that, that's our heritage. Jimmy, did all, Jimmy had his defects like the rest of us. He was self-centered like the rest of us, but his heart was for us, a place where we could be. And it was very, very sad to see those things happen. But we're, we're a fellowship and we're growing and we put that stuff behind us. But we don't forget about that stuff. And it's not a resentment because we, if we don't know our history, we'll repeat the same thing over and over again. And I've heard people say the Gray Book is an illegal, non-approved literature. And it's written by some crazy addicts today. But the big Gray Book is what the basic text came out of. They mentioned in there, and both didn't answer the question about the matchbooks and the napkins and everything. There was only a certain amount of people who could afford to go to the literature committee, but the addicts all over the world got coffee stained napkins getting put on matchbooks, and it went into the literature committee, and they typed that stuff up and paste and so forth and voted on that stuff, and that's why that process was different. Yet, it takes a lot longer than doing it and hiring a professional writer, but it's our labor of love. <laughs> And they edited stuff in there because they said the professional community, and not they, the community community, the office edited things in the basic text as we keep saying, because they said the professional rehabilitation community would not approve things like, I like, pissed on Stalin's grave. Well, I understand what the hell that means. There was another line in there, Narcotics Anonymous doesn't make sick people well, it brings dead people back to life. Oh, you can't have that in the book for a professional. But every addict knows we were all spiritually dead. That's why written by addicts for addicts and not being edited by a professional is so important. Even if the, the professional writer is an addict, they're still being paid to do the job and they have to follow the people who are paying them what to do. So it takes longer to do it the old way. So what? Now, I'm not saying any of that literature is bad. How it works in my has a lot of beautiful things in. Living Clean has a lot of good things. Uh, guiding Principles all have, that's not garbage literature, but it wasn't written by a labor of love. And that's the only difference I'm saying that, that is into it. And there's only one piece of literature that I will personally do not like. And again, I'm not speaking for Narcotics Anonymous, I'm speaking for Vito. And that's that damn flat book. <laughs> And the reason I don't like it, because not that there's bad stuff in it, they don't have a disclaimer in there. That should say you should not use this book unless you're under the guidance of a sponsor. Yeah. Because we know people are using this as a home study course and they don't need a sponsor anymore. They got the flat book. And I hear that all over the country. Well, I don't need a sponsor. I got the flat book. And again, I'm not saying there's nothing bad in the flat book if they just put a simple disclaimer in the front. Do not attempt to do this book without the guidance of a sponsor would make it okay. Because I believe in sponsorship. I believe deeply in it. And I love Narcotics Anonymous. And I'm not an outsider, I'm an insider. And even though I disagree with a lot of the political stuff going on in this fellowship, my heart is in Narcotics Anonymous. And I think this whole fellowship would heal if the, they, the board, if, when they appoint to the board, the board of trustees, if they would have a majority and a minority opinion in it. Yeah. Because that was the dream of Jimmy, to allow majority and minority things. And, and the, the board of trustees, as it's composed today, is strictly a majority opinion of what the office wants. Now, the people in the office are not bad people. They're addicts, just like us. Most of them, like Anthony runs the office. He's an addict in Washington, D.C. 
but somehow I think they forgot the purpose is you got to have a minority. You got to, if they would just let the minority have to speak, even if they didn't get their way, there would be a healing. But of course, they don't ask me. <laughs> if they ask me, they're asking a fool because I'm just like every other asshole. I got an opinion too. But I thank God for the committee. Now, I thank God Bo, and a lot of people don't like when I say this because they say you're giving Bo too much credit. He didn't write the book, the committee did. But I'm gonna tell you something. If you have an arrow and you're going hunting and you see a deer over there, try pulling that bow back and shooting that arrow without an arrowhead on it. And Bo Sewell was the arrowhead on there. He got things done, he was a shaker. I've known Bo for a long time. I've traveled on airplanes with him. I broke bread. I even slept in the same room with him. We didn't have sex, but we slept together. <laughs> and he's a shaker and doer. You give Bo a job to do, he will do it. He gets things done. There are certain people in this world who make things happen. He makes them happen. He was the arrowhead on that, on that arrow. And that was very important. I came in here, I was stupid as can be because I knew everything there was. You ask me anything, I had the answer. <laughs> but you know, the New York City cops were always knocking on my door. And so my parents were, well, one of my parents was very smart. Every time that happened, they would pack my suitcase and send me up to Western New York to the great Seneca Nation. Because when I was in there and Grandma Teela was my mentor, they couldn't touch me. And I had a lot of people trying to help me and straighten me out. And, and, and Grandma Tyla, who was a Wolf Clan mother, she would always tell me how things should be and bring out spiritually. And she prepared me for my first sweat, my vision quest, where I met the white buffalo woman. But I didn't pay attention. I thought it was a joke. But today, all those things come into my program and they come through the guys I sponsor. And a lot of my sponsors know the Wolf Clan and White Buffalo Meditation because they go on their vision quest. So these are principles and the principles of the 12 steps and the 12 traditions. The steps told me how to overcome my disease. It's like a, a, a caterpillar crawling on the ground, going into the steps, forming a cocoon and coming out as a butterfly above, looking the ground I crawled. And the 12 traditions teaching me how to have a relationship with other people. My relationship was if I had a motion I wanted to pass an area of service, I would show up at the baseball bat. That's how sick I was. But through the traditions I've learned, each one of those traditions not only tells me how I have a relationship with my home group members, if I learn how to do that, then I can have relationships with other people on the job, with romantic relationships. And that's all because of the tradition. You know, if you're working the step, you're working half a program. You have to work the tradition to have a whole program. It's very important. You know, having half a meal might be fine. You know, I feel a little bit of hunger. So I eat the whole damn meal, I feel good. And that's why I need steps and traditions. You know, meetings are important, but meetings is not the program, it's fellowship. This is fellowship. Conventions are fellowship, and we need the fellowship. But the program of Narcotics Anonymous is 12 steps and 12 traditions. There are 24 spiritual principles. And I don't want to break any bubble, but the concepts are not spiritual principles, they're service principles. I hear people working the concept. They're business principles. They're not spiritual principles. And don't even get me started on that. I got a lot to say about that. A lot, everybody in this room has been here a long time, and we know how that got dope being through. We're going to adapt the AA 12, 12 concepts, and by the time they got done, they were rewritten completely. They're not even similar to the AA concepts. They have little loopholes how to get around the traditions in them. You know, you put Robert's rules here and the 12 concepts here, and I can break any tradition and point to the concepts and say it's okay. We know that because we were here before the concepts, when the traditions were the law, non-negotiable. 
And I didn't see anything taken out of our literature about that. But live and let live, you know? I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to go back to the trenches and create war because war, you don't, we don't win anything through war. You win it by example. You work the principles where they're undeniable that they work. We treat each other as spiritual brothers and sisters, even if they're opposed to what we do. We love them so much that the Creator shines our light on them. Not through our power, but through that. I got a few minutes left, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the steps. Because that is our program. Somebody tell me the first word, the first step, because the, the brain don't compute. We. And what comes after we? Admitted. We admit it. Come on, Brian. We admit it. That. That. We. That we. Were. were. And our lives had become unmanaged. We admitted we were powerless. What were we powerless over? Addiction. What does admitted mean? Hell, in the street, we admit it every day. I gotta stop doing this. <laughs> Admitting by itself, but the first step is a three part process. We admit, then we accept what we admitted. And then we surrender to it. And if you hadn't done those three things in the first step, you haven't worked the first step. We admit it. We accept it. We surrendered that we were powerless over our addiction. And then it has meaning. And our life had become, it doesn't say it is unmanageable, had become as a result of that addiction. But the minute we surrendered, it's a new life. The first step is like taking all of our clothes off in the middle of a highway. You see those lights flashing pretty soon. But the second step is putting on a new set of clothes. If I choose to live the next 11 steps, I have a choice. Recovery is always a choice. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Well, at that moment, I was an agnostic until somebody asked me why I wasn't an atheist. Well, of course, I'm an addict. I'm pretty damn sharp. Just in case I die, and when you're 20 years old, you're never going to die. There happens to be a God. I want him. No, I wasn't a damn agnostic. I mean, I wasn't a damn atheist. I was only an agnostic. The guy says to me, yeah, typical addict. You got to have stash. Back door. Okay, God. I didn't say you didn't exist. I said, maybe. <laughs> but isn't that the attic way? Until my sponsor advised me that it said we came to believe that I could be restored to sanity. And that sanity wasn't criminal insanity. It wasn't legal insanity. It was addict insanity of doing the same thing over and over again. But this time it's going to be different. It's like the little boy puts his hand on the stove. Mom says, stop, don't do that, you'll burn yourself. He's a potential addict already because he looks at mom and he says, oh yeah? Boom, burns his hand. Isn't that who we are? We get in a relationship and it's horrible. Oh, it's so damn horrible. <laughs> and we break up and we hurt. And who do we get in a relation with? Same person, different face, yeah. different names. <laughs> addict insanity. We quit our job because it's horrible. What do we do? We get a new job. Different boss, same same job. Insanity. We keep doing it over and over again. Until somebody says to me, even if you believe in the creator, it's not going to open up and all these angels are going to come down and fix you. It's going to work to people, places, and things. Yeah. Something you hear a person share. Something you read in the book. Something heard at a meeting. That's God restoring you to sanity. It happens here. Miracles happen every day here. And we watch it. Bo speared the basic text. He's like Clarence. He earned his wings. I almost, at Christmas time, you all see that movie where Clarence wins his wings. Bo had his wings so he could sit back and fly above us. <laughs> 
<laughs> but you know that, that's the beauty of this program. You know, we learn, we get restored to sanity, and then we play it forward. That's what sponsoring is. We're playing it forward. Give it to us, we give it away. The third step. We made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Now, the last part of that says we understood him. It does not say as we understand him. And yet I hear people repeating the third step. and say, God as we understand him. It says God as we understood it. It's that way for a reason. Because if it said God as we understand it, that would mean Narcotics Anonymous would have an understanding of God. But by saying God as we understood it allows each and every one of us to have a personal understanding of God. So God as I understand it can be different than Brian's understanding of God. Because the fellowship gave us the process by saying God as we understood it. So each and every one of us could have a different perception of what God is. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And we made a decision. And the decision is making a commitment. Now, when we make commitments, we can't always keep it. But making the commitment and making the effort to keep it is very important. That's the beauty of the third step. Even if we can't do it, we make the commitment to try. To turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. And how's that done? What is our will in our lives? My life is everything that happens to me from the time I get up in the morning to the time I go to bed at night. That's my life. My will is my reaction to everything that happens from the time I get up to the time I go to bed. If you look at it that way, you got the concept of what your will in your life is. So what you do, you take everything you're going to do that day, every person you meet, every situation you're going to be, and instead of reacting, we go and count to ten like the big people used to tell us when we were little so that we could stop and respond rather than react. Your girlfriend breaks up with you. Boom, I'm going to show her. I'm going to go out and get screwed up. I'm going to use. She's going on with her life and I can't get back here. Response rather than react. That's the key to the third step. It's not easy. I still react. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. But I try to respond more today than I ever did in my life. That's the change. We learn to respond. Turning my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood them is to stop them reacting to everything that happened and learn to respond and life gets better. First three steps of recovery are the foundation of recovery. They'll keep you clean for a while. Back in the old days, we used to have two-steppers. Oscar, Bo, you remember the two-steppers? Come in, work the first step, do 12-step work, and then you relapse? Well, you got a whole bunch of steps in between. Yes. 12-step work. How can you do 12-step work if you haven't worked the 12-step? Because the message of 12 steps is that they work. You go into prison, you speak, you carry. I'm giving you a message of 12-step call, 12-step work. But if you haven't worked the 12 steps, you can't give that message because the message is of us. The 12-step is transformation and it takes me from here to there. So there's no shortcuts. Sure, it's okay to do 12-step work under the guidance of your sponsor while you're working the other step. And you're telling the people on the facilities and the rehab and the jail that the steps are the answer. And you relate your story so that they can relate to you and know that you're pretty screwed up just like them. But you have to be able to relate. And then we go to the steps four through nine, what they call the cleansing steps, because they clean us emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And it's not okay to be physically clean and spiritually dirty. And we see people with decades clean, parking with a tent outside of rehab, hitting on the newcomers, they walk out. Both male and female. It's not okay to be physically clean and spiritually dirty. And four through nine take us through that process. I do a search of fearless moral inventory and have to use a dictionary because I don't know what morals are. And go through it and write it and look at my life. And this is how it was when I was in my diction, and this is how I am today. I write twice. Once where how it was, and once how it is. This and how far I come in between. Because I even have to see I'm growing. Other people may see it, but I can't see it unless I say, this is how it was, this is my attitude, this is my attitude today. There's a change. Going with somebody and share a fifth step. The exact nature of the wrong. Not the history. Not that I'm jealous. Not that I did this and not that I did that. The fifth step is getting in. Why do I do that? 
Why can't I stand my girlfriend talking to another man? What brings the rage up in here? What brings the killer instinct out? What's going on? What's the exact nature? What's bringing it? That's what the fifth step's about on all of our defects. Why do we do it, not what we do? Anger, people say, is a defect. Anger is not a defect. It's how you use the anger. Because anger can save your life. The exact nature. And if you're not working with your sponsees for the exact nature of what's going on, you're not helping them and you're not helping yourself. And then the sixth step follows the fifth step. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. It does not say God removes them. It's that veto becomes entirely ready. Step of willingness. And how do you do it? Take a piece of paper like this. Draw a line down the center. This is where I am. Defect, defect, defect. Opposite, opposite, opposite. Here's where I am. This is where I need to go. And a lot of people confuse the sixth and seventh step. My my wife that passed away 20 some years ago when she shared a convention, she would always say, the sixth step is packing the suitcase and the seventh step is taking the trip. Because in the seventh step, now we turn them over to God and God removes them. But how does God remove them? Through the first three steps. First, I have to admit I got a problem, and then I go down the first step and I surrender. I accept, I, I admit, accept, and surrender. I don't try to fight it. I'm feeling jealous. My body's coming apart. I'm falling apart, and I don't try to deny it. I accept, and I surrender. This is how I feel, and I go to the second step, and I look at it, and I want to do it different, and I go to the third step, and I turn it over to my creator, to God, how I understand him, and then go back to the second step and do it different. Will they go away overnight? But they will go away. I was the jealous rage guy. I couldn't stay in the relationship because my fist would go after my mouth even got done. Crazy insanity. Consumed with jealousy. And I had to go down and feel it and experience it and so forth and admit and take a look at the exact nature of where it's coming from and work on it. Did it go away immediately? No, but I can tell you it's 40 some years before I had that kind of a relationship with a woman. I'm not proud that I hit women, but I haven't done it in over 40 years as a result of the step. And the men don't talk about it anymore, and we know it still goes on. It goes on. And that's where sponsorship comes in and say, it's okay to feel that way. Now let's work on it and get rid of it. But if you don't talk about it, nothing happens. Yeah. The eighth step, we made a list. And became willing to make amends. And I told my sponsor, when I become willing, I'll make the, the amends. He said, read the step. Unfortunately, the step says, make the list, then become willing. He said, okay, I'll do it. But I don't want to do it because everybody owes me Christmas presents. I don't owe anybody anything. And the nature of the addiction, once you get busy doing it, all of a sudden you want to go out and make amends to the world. Well, you any guidance of a sponsor. Sponsor says, that's why we have the nine step. We make direct amends to all those we'd harmed, except when to do so would injure them or others. And that means you don't call your grandmother up and say, remember when your diamond was gone? Hello. You created more harm. She had the harm already. But you don't get no free pass. You make financial amends anonymously. It's your amends, not her. And you're not making amends. I just love this one. The guys go and they cheat on their wife and they cheat on their wife and they cheat on their wife. And so they feel so guilty, they got to sit down with their wife now and say, I've been cheating on you. Now they created more harm. The making the amends is stop doing it. There's a, that's the, that's the amends. You don't go hurt somebody else to clear your conscience. But yet we see people do it. See, we, we make amends except to harm somebody. And that also means not to harm ourselves. That's why it says others, and we're part of others. I don't walk into the 46th precinct and say, uh, I think there was a gang stopping in front of PS 118th at 100 and, oh, 179th and Arthur Avenue, and I think maybe somebody got stopped or dead. I'm sure the cold cases will help you find somebody. <laughs> no, going in and going back to jail for something you did in your addiction is not making amends. Rehabilitation is not doing it anymore. And yet I see people come in the rooms and turn themselves in. Now, if the authorities know who you are and there's a warrant for your arrest, 
you have to do the right thing. But if it's something that's gone and under the table, you don't go to cold cases and say, oh, by the way, here, I'm here to help you. <laughs> you rehabilitate yourself by not doing it again. That's the important thing. Everything is good. Everything is good if we live the steps. And it's time for me almost to finish up. I got about five minutes. So I'm going to talk about 10, 11, 12. They're the maintenance steps. I'm to maintain what I got through the first nine and grow on top of it. Maintenance and growth. I gained all this through the first nine steps. Now I need to grow on top of it. You know, 11 steps. We continue to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admit it. Most people think you say you're sorry and that's the end of it. It's not the I'm sorry set. It's going through it. You, I don't write a 10 step anymore. I can be honest with you. I did it for about 17, 18 years. So I know the pattern in my head. I go through my day. I see what I did wrong. And I try not to do it again. You know, that is so much greater than an apology because it's a living amends. You know, you look through it and you do it. And that's maintaining your daily inventory. And if you do that, you don't have to go back to doing four steps over and over again. Yeah, I agree. You need to do four steps on many things that keep coming up in your life that you can't control. You keep doing that over and over again. But you don't do an entire fourth step if you're doing the 10th step. And the 11th step I call the cornerstone of recovery, even though it's another. We saw it through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Again, understood him. Praying for the knowledge of his will and the power to carry that out. We saw it. That means each and every one of us are seekers. We're seeking to fill that big belly hole that we have, which we fill the food and the, the, the drugs and everything else, and we still do it in recovery. So if we saw it through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious, constant contact with God, it says improve, so we damn better well have started in the third step of building a relationship because we're improving. Praying only for the knowledge of his will for us. What is the knowledge of God's will for us? I remember as a newcomer sitting around with other newcomers, and we're discussing what God's will is for us. 90-day wonders. What's God's will in this situation? Until I had a sponsor sit me down, he said, you want to know what God's will is? I'm going to tell you what God's will. God's will is the highest good for anybody in any given situation. I said, huh? He said, the highest good of anybody in any given situation. Guy just breaks up with his wife or gets divorced. He's got two or three kids. He, he wants, he's supposed to have support payments. He says, shit, I ain't paying no support. She's only going to go out and use it in the bar or give it to her boyfriend. I ain't paying. What's the highest good? You do your responsibility and pay your child support. That's God's will. What she does with it is none of your damn business. Whatever the situation is, what's the highest good? Everybody concerned in that situation. That's God's will. But you see, this was written by addicts. Because it says praying for the power to carry it out. Because we know what God's will is. And damn, I don't want to do it because my ego says, no, I ain't giving her the satisfaction. So we have to pray like hell to carry it out. That's God's will. And that's why once you've got some recovery, the 11th step is the key to your recovery ongoing. Then the kicker, as a result of these steps, we, can't, we carry this message to other addicts and try to practice them in all our affairs. As a result of these steps, we had, oh, as a result of these steps, we had a spiritual awakening. What is that spiritual awakening? Da, the steps work. Yeah, we want to complicate it like a one-car funeral. The steps work. So the 12-step message is that these steps work, and i got to carry this message to other addicts that the steps are the answer and continue practicing them in my life. And that's why if you're not working the steps or have not worked all the steps, you can't do 12-step work because you can't give that message. That is the 12 step. I wish I had time to go through all 12 traditions, but unfortunately, time is of an essence here. There's other speakers. I surrender. I love you all. Thanks for having me here.